Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We're very happy you could join us. My name is Brianna Humphreys and I am the Marketing Manager for K-12 Education Products at Brooks Publishing. Before we get started today, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You will be muted for today's webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box. We will take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion of our webinar. <coughs> for the presentation, you might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see more of your screen. You can do that by clicking the orange button with the arrow in the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask a question, you can just click that orange button again. If you experience any audio issues at any point, you can switch to phone by clicking in the audio section of the webinar panel and using the dial-in information provided. Also, one quick note, we are recording today's webinar, so everyone who registered for the event should receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. Today, we're very lucky to have Ms. Danielle Empson and Dr. Tim Noster here with us. Ms. Empson is the Director of School-Based Behavioral Health of the McDowell Institute at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Noster is the Executive Director of the McDowell Institute and a professor at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania. The McDowell Institute is dedicated to supporting the facilitation of social, emotional, and behavioral wellness of children, youth, and young adults across school and community settings. This mission is accomplished through training, technical assistance, and information dissemination. The McDowell Institute is currently operating more than 40 interrelated initiatives in play to facilitate social, emotional, and behavioral wellness of children, youth, and young adults across school and community settings. Danielle and Tom, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you, and we're very excited to be here. Um, we're gonna jump right in and get started with discussing various kind of key learnings that we've both um, experienced through our transition to virtual instruction and how to enhance our student engagement. So you'll wanna provide explicit guidance around how you expect your students to interact with you, their classmates and the curriculum. It can be helpful to think about the various contexts that you'll be utilizing, whether that be email communication, small group work in a virtual meeting platform, um, discussion boards of any kind. What we're really suggesting in this regard is just like you would in a typical classroom, is establishing maybe three to three or so general expectations, such as be responsible, be respectful, and be engaged, which creates a simple trail of breadcrumbs for your students to follow. Help your students to picture what they would look like and sound like to you as their teacher when they're meeting these expectations across the various activities associated with your virtual instruction, which kind of provides a roadmap towards their success. What you're trying to do in this regard is to minimize guesswork for your students and reduce the number of headaches you'll have for yourself instructionally by clearly communicating how you want your students to both initiate virtual communications with you as well as with their classmates. Um, and then in turn, uh, this can enhance timeliness of communication and helps to provide structure and predictability, which provides reassurance and helps to enhance student achievement. Further, as important as it is to clarify expectations uh, and communication patterns outside of class sessions, it's also helpful to establish ground rules for communication with and between class sessions. Establishing ground rules early on helps to minimize problems down the road. The bottom line is being clear about what we expect from our students creates predictability. And predictability is more needed today, as we all know, than ever with the degree of uncertainties that are present for ourselves as well as our students. Providing predictability can have a reassuring effect with our students, which can enhance student achievement, their engagement, as well as our own personal degree of satisfaction as teachers. You want to identify high frequency virtual routines that students may have challenges with and pre correct for error. This could be as straightforward as reminding students to have their cameras on at all times and microphones muted during large group instruction at the onset of class. You want to proactively remind your students about your established expectations 
And by doing this, it can help to minimize behavioral errors and increase student engagement pretty significantly. As a general guide, all students benefit from having a sense of predictability and structure associated uh, with well-communicated uh, performance expectations. Pre-correction in this sense can be delivered in a variety of simple, very time efficient ways. One simple way is to provide verbal reminders about the expectations before starting the planned learning activity, such as one person speaks at a time during virtual discussions, and in turn, ask the students to restate the expectation back to you via the private chat mechanism or comment mechanism on your virtual learning platform. It can also be helpful to provide visual cues and prompts reflecting the established expectations throughout virtual instruction on a periodic basis by using your screen sharing feature to periodically display those expectations. The old saying of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure nicely sums up the value of providing pre-correction with your students. Just as when you're in your typical classroom settings, pre-correction increases the likelihood that your students will be meaningfully engaged and successful throughout your virtual instruction. Depending on one's level of comfort or familiarity with online instruction, it can sometimes be challenging to think of ways to provide students various opportunities to respond. We wanted to share with you a few ideas to create variety throughout virtual instruction. One, one idea might be is that you could provide students in advanced organizers with focus questions to be prepared to discuss during virtual class sessions. This can help students to feel more comfortable or confident in large group instruction, as well as to feel more prepared to share um, their opinions. You might also utilize um, polling software to gather opinion-based responses through your synchronous or asynchronous instructions. So as, as important as it is to provide structure and predictability, as we were talking about earlier, so too is the case in providing an array of opportunities to respond or OTRs as we'll refer to them. This is not by any means unique to virtual instruction. However, the two-dimensional nature of virtual instruction arguably makes the provision of OTRs even all the more important. OTRs come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and not all forms of OTRs fit all situations. In the virtual classroom, you can employ individual responding, group or unison responding, intermixing individual with group responding, and of course, peer-to-peer -peer responding. You can as well uh, also solicit student responses through traditional verbal responses, gestural responses, including sign language, as well as uh, through the use of polling software, as Danielle had alluded to, such as the use of iClicker. Depending on the virtual learning platform you're using, you can explore the student response system that comes with that platform, such as Zoom, Google Classroom, or Canvas. Also explore the options associated with that virtual learning platform for students to be able to share their work with classmates as well as with you. When it comes to OTRs, no one size fits all situations. So the, be key, the key becomes in diversifying an array of OTRs that you employ in alignment with your virtual instruction. You want to track student engagement by collecting data on the number of times and or types of interactions each student has. This will help you identify those students who are more passive in participation. So using data to monitor the degree of student engagement in your virtual lessons can help you to increase student engagement in an equitable manner. Just as in the typical classroom, there will be some students that will naturally, almost on their own, be more likely to meaningfully participate than others. As such, it's important to ensure that each student engages to a sufficient degree, while also ensuring that those students that appear more eager to engage do not disproportionately dominate responses during a given instructional session. Just as in your typical classroom, this can be somewhat tricky to navigate and requires conscious planning and delivery of instruction on your part. Gathering and using simple tracking data to monitor student comments, questions, and responses can really make monitoring student engagement a manageable task. One of the easiest low-tech ways to gather this type of information is by having a list of your students' names on a piece of paper on your desk 
while you are providing the virtual instruction and simply keeping a running tally of comments, questions, or responses. This can be further augmented with data that emerges through your use of polling software in the event that you're using such technology. Predictably, as you review the data you've collected, you'll notice patterns of student engagement. Use this information to consider ways in which you could increase active involvement with students that appear less engaged. This can take on many forms, including the use of the private chat or comments feature of your learning platform to build in brief smaller interactions from peer to peer, such as think pair shares, as well as small group discussions, just as you might have done so in the typical classroom. An expectation that you might build into your course is to have each student create an original discussion post and also have them respond to a targeted number of peer posts in a given time frame. The use of discussion threads can help enhance student engagement in, the, in your virtual operations pretty significantly. You're encouraged to consider building into your performance expectations explicit requirements for students to engage in discussion threads concerning course content on a scheduled basis. How often you require students to initiate, read, or respond to discussion threads will vary, of course, based on the age of your kids, how frequently your class convenes, as well as the nature of the curriculum. Consider as well providing clear guidance to students, not only on the required frequency of engagement through discussion threads, but also the parameters on acceptable versus non-acceptable types of posts. It should prove helpful to provide a few examples as well as non-examples of acceptable posts that can serve as a roadmap for your students. The use of discussion threads, particularly if you allow for expressions of opinion and interpretation that can differ from student to student, can really serve as a very effective way to increase engagement in general, and most specifically with students that appear less engaged than desired. Further reinforce desired behaviors and student engagement by acknowledging students that are meeting the established expectations. So it's important to know that some students will want more public acknowledgements, while others will want private praise. It can be helpful to ask students their preference early on, and you can do this in a private manner, um, whether it's in a, a chat group or um, over email. You want to explicitly acknowledge efforts of students, and it's especially important for those that appear less engaged or those who are struggling with the course content. And while you're dispersing acknowledgements across all students, think of various ways to provide acknowledgement utilizing the technology that you have available. So maybe that would mean using verbal praise for some students in a large group setting, and for others that might mean privately chatting them and maybe using emojis or sending a, you know, a large class email or private emails. You'll also want to anticipate that some students will need more frequent acknowledgements and encouragement than others. So beyond providing that diverse array of OTRs that we were just previously covering on the prior slide, acknowledging your students for meeting your expectations will likely play a big part in the degree to which students actively engage in your virtual classroom. You can acknowledge effort as well as essential lifelong learning skills such as punctuality, preparation, and social problem solving, along with performance of skills that are directly reflective of the course curriculum. When acknowledging students as a group or a given student as an individual, be sure to align your de delivery of that acknowledgement to the specific behavior you wish to reinforce. For example, if students that are working as a group or a small group are meeting expectations, providing virtual group praise might make sense. On the other hand, if you wish to acknowledge an individual student, the acknowledgement should be provided in a private virtual manner. The goal is to provide a greater number of acknowledgement for desired behavior than redirection for undesired behavior throughout your virtual instruction. The target is a general guide, just as it was in the classroom under normal conditions, is to try to achieve a four to one ratio with your students as a whole or a group, as well as with each individual student within a reasonable targeted time frame. Without question, your students will be far more likely to be constructively engaged in your virtual classroom and your instruction 
when they feel as if they're being acknowledged for their effort as well as their performance. Undoubtedly, a student will act out in an undesired manner. This is true whether you're in a traditional classroom environment or in a virtual one. So while you can remove a student from a virtual meeting room or you can mute students like all of you currently are, um, you might have some undesired effects. So here are a few less to more intrusive response procedures that you can employ. So it's predictable that some students will periodically engage in undesired behavior during virtual instruction. Hopefully, of course, this will not occur real frequently. And when it does, the nature of the undesired behavior won't be too problematic or significant. Acknowledging this reality, it's helpful to be planned in advance with an array of redirection procedures that you can employ in a virtual manner that align with addressing both the frequency or the severity of the undesired behavior. In particular, you're encouraged to have a pre-organized continuum or a hierarchy, so to speak, of redirection procedures that you can easily implement as the need arises. Having a planned continuum in advance and ready to go on an as needed basis can help you to maintain the flow of virtual instruction for all of your students, as well as to re-engage the student of concern in a constructive manner, and also to maintain a calm, even keel demeanor when uh, needing to redirect a given student uh, based upon their behavioral uh, challenge. So some strategies that you might employ are to provide pre-corrections as we previously talked about. Another way is to utilize the praise around strategy. So praising those students for meeting the expe expectation that another one might not be. And then when that student does display the desired behavior, praise them for that. So in the event that uh, the student misbehavior does surface during virtual instruction, the first thing that you're encouraged to do is determine what type of undesired behavior is actually being displayed. As you'll likely already know, some undesired behaviors require immediate redirection, while other forms of undesired behavior are best addressed through more gradual or subtle means. We would encourage you to think about having two buckets in which you could kind of place the two different types of undesired behavior. The first bucket is for nuisance behavior such as brief time frames of off-task behavior, with the second bucket being for problem behavior, such as prolonged off-task or behavior that's disruptive to the learning of others. The praise around strategy that Danielle just highlighted, uh, sometimes referred to as planned ignoring and pivoting as well, can be very useful when responding to a, a student that's displaying nuisance behavior, not problem behavior, but nuisance behavior. The application of this strategy in the virtual environment is very similar to how you'd employ the same procedure in your typical classroom, with one main exception. That exception being you're in far less a good position to exercise physical proximity for obvious reasons. Despite this difference though, this particular strategy, the praise around strategy, may prove highly effective and reasonably time efficient for you to be able to redirect that nuisance level behavior with the student. Additionally, you could use visual or gestural redirection prompts as subtle reminders for low level disruptive behaviors. You could also employ the using the private chat feature um, for stopped redirect reinforced procedures for more high level disruptive behaviors such as a student making a sarcastic remark about another student um, in, in a whole group environment. Um, you'll wanna make sure that you follow up with the student post the virtual session privately to review the performance expectations, as well as encourage desired behavior moving forward with that student. Now, ideally, of course, you won't encounter student behaviors that you end up sorting into the problem behavior bucket. So that would be nice to think and certainly hope for, but there is a good chance that that might not be the case. Um, so in the event that you do end up with a student engaging behavior that you have to redirect, here are a few more increasingly direct approaches to consider that build on what was just uh, overviewed for you. 
One approach, which is still somewhat subtle, is to visually redisplay the expectations that you already emphasized as a pre-correction prior to the start of the virtual class lesson. You can do this by screen sharing for brief moments of time, almost like subliminal messaging, where you just have the expectations reappear periodically and then they disappear periodically. An additional, increasingly more direct approach without question is to use the private chat or comment feature in your virtual learning platform to communicate with the student of concern. And using this approach, try to be direct, explicit, and not get drawn into lengthy discussions with the student, at least not at this moment in time. That can certainly occur at a later point in time, as Danielle had uh, highlighted in terms of recircling back with that student. Explicitly tell the student by name, privately of course, to stop the undesired behavior, then tell them exactly what it is you want them to do, then privately acknowledge their compliance with your redirection once that occurs. An example, just to illustrate the stop redirect component, would be a private virtual chat or comment such as, John, stop making inappropriate noises when your classmates are sharing their opinions. I want you to listen attentively and silently when others are speaking. Then, as soon as John demonstrates this desired behavior, send a follow-up private virtual comment or chat to him saying something to the effect of, thanks, John, for listening silently as Sarah was speaking. Please keep up the good work. The key with redirection procedures is to deliver them in a manner that is effective and time efficient. To this end, you're encouraged to have a game plan in advance in order to maintain the flow of virtual instruction for all of your students, as well as to be able to re-engage that student of concern in a constructive manner, and then as well to maintain that calm, even keeled demeanor that you need to be able to portray and facilitate the virtual learning session. All of these strategies in total, when put together, help to increase the likelihood of meaningful, constructive student engagement in your virtual classroom. So with that, I think we're gonna open it up for questions here, if I'm not mistaken. So Brianna, it's gonna come back to you. Thanks so much, Tim, um, for a great presentation. And thanks to Danielle too. Um, just a reminder to everyone that continue submitting your questions and we're gonna go ahead and jump into the Q&A portion. Um, we do have a question from someone who's asking if you have specific tips and strategies for engaging students who might have learning disabilities. In terms of the application of these procedures that we highlighted in this session, um, functionally, the application of these would be generalizable across pretty much all pop populations. Now, if you do have kids with, say, communication challenges, um, you're going to need to be able to communicate in, in, a, in a level and in a manner that makes sense to that particular student. But the actual engagement strategies themselves are not necessarily, from our perspective, highly unique to, say, a particular disability type. These are kind of general universal engagement strategies. Um, now, that does not suggest that there uh, will not be in need with particular ind individual kids based on their IEP um, to look at the nature of that specially designed instruction that's already embedded in the IEP and to perhaps tailor your delivery of virtual instruction in that regard. Um, but uh, my take on it would be fundamentally it's, it's the application of specially designed instruction, accommodations and modifications, while it's in a different platform, from an instructional design standpoint is very similar as to what you had in, in, in the traditional classroom. It's just you're kind of stuck in this two-dimensional world with a flat screen um, and you don't have the ability to engage more personally directly and use things like proximity, handover, hand prompting and gesturing and those types of things. Um, one other thought along those lines would be that, again, depending on both the age of the students as well as um, the degree of independence um, that they have in terms of functioning, um, it's very likely that a number of kids, particularly younger kids or say individual students with significant disabilities, 
would have somebody with them, not necessarily independently engaging online. So you might want to uh, planfully communicate with those people in advance some of the strategies that you might almost intuitively do or have paraprofessionals do if you have paraprofessionals embedded in your classroom uh, to, be, to be able to utilize them as proxy as they're in proximity with the particular kiddo. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question we have received is if you have any specific strategies or tips for educators who are working with younger children, such as, um, it was noted here, Head Start or pre-K classes, so children ages three to age five. Danielle, I'll, I'll start this one out. If you wanna jump in, you're welcome to it as well. But again, it's the, the key is that age appropriate alignment. Um, actually, my wife's a kindergarten teacher and she's living in a virtual environment right now. And that's fundamentally different than say, um, a 10th grade algebra teacher. Um, not that one's easier than the other, but they're, they're fundamentally different uh, uh, students in terms of where they're at. Uh, in terms of working with younger kids, um, to some extent, uh, the more that, if not parent, guardian, or somebody can be with them and should be with them, um, the better, and I would probably, the, the primary thing I would really uh, dive down deeper into is actually just the same way or use the same approach that you might use in how do you organize um, the use of either volunteers and or paraprofessional staff in your classroom. Um, I would encourage really systematically communicating with those those individuals well in advance and invest the time and energy with them if in fact they're going to be there in the household uh, which is more likely where, where everybody's at right now if they're in that household with that kiddo helping them navigate through um, the virtual environment um, you can certainly use the larger group types of settings but um, and I think this is true with older kids as well, but it's particularly necessary with younger kids. Having, having a group of 25 first or second graders all on uh, for a, an extended block of time in a two-dimensional world um, is probably not going to be particularly effective. So breaking things into smaller group work um, and actually using, um, depending on the platform you're using, uh, actually to cluster kids into smaller learning groups for things and then maybe look at creative scheduling of timing and that you're convening with small groups rather than large group. Those are the things that would come immediately to mind. Yeah, and I know a lot of our um, programs in Pennsylvania are utilizing different types of learning-based apps. So that age group, they might be familiar with playing games on a caregiver's phone or on a tablet. So kind of transitioning transitioning that learning environment away from a Zoom platform and into more app-based where an educator can monitor and track their progress, as well as provide reinforcements through badges or things of that nature can also be really helpful. Those are both really great suggestions. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do wanna be mindful of our time because we're already almost at 2.30, believe it or not. So um, if it's okay, Tim and Danielle, we'll follow up with you separately about some of the additional questions you've received today, and we can follow up with attendees after the webinar. Excellent. Sounds good. It was our pleasure to be here. Great. Um, I just have a couple few additional notes from Brooks real quick that I would like to share. Mm -hmm. um, for everybody who is joining us today, we um, are offering a special discount on our products, including Dr. Noster's books, uh, the Teacher's Pocket Guide for Effective Classroom Management and the Teacher's Pocket Guide for Positive Behavior Support. And that's good through the end of June. So anyone watching today um, or the webcast afterwards can just use code Coffee Talk at checkout to receive their discount. Um, and if you're looking for additional professional development webinar opportunities over the next couple weeks, be sure to visit the Berks Publishing website for the latest additions to our Coffee Chat series, um, as well as for additional COVID-19 resources. So here you'll find recommended reading, downloadable resources, and additional professional development webinars. 
So once again, thank you to Dr. Noster and Ms. Epson for a great webinar. There were a lot of really wonderful tips presented today. So thank you for that. Thanks a lot. Take care. Be well, folks. Thank you all.